All right, let's find a new slide deck now. <laughs> All right, it is 11.35 in my watch, so we'll get started. We've given five minutes buffer for people to get in and let them come in. Uh, so this title of this talk is Inverting the Pyramid, uh, and we can introduce the word testing in it because I'm going to eliminate the word testing from it eventually. Uh, that's essentially the idea of this talk. This is an experience report of me having done this for two specific organizations where we have uh, inverted the testing pyramid, and I'll talk about what that means and why the title. Uh, so everyone's familiar with, uh, you know, back in the Stone Age, the kind of development we did, and there's the surprise. Yes? So what do we see in, in stuff like this, right? When we do development in this fashion where we plan, design, distribute work, work in isolation, and then come back and try to integrate stuff, right? I've not even put the testing part yet, right? Uh, I'm just talking about this, even this stage, we see a big surprise. Uh, so what we see generally is a lot of last minute surprises. Bad things are visible too late and we find that as a real problem, all right? Actually, let me pause for a second and ask how many people got a chance to look the slides before they came in, okay? So for some people, what I'm going to talk is kind of sounding familiar, uh, but for the rest of them, we'll kind of go a little slower. Because my idea is to brush through first initial section and spend a lot of time uh, getting into more interactive session where I want to talk through some basics and then get people's experience and kind of take it from there on an evolutionary path, all right? So bad things are visible too late. We, we get last minute surprises. This, is, this, is, this was a typical problem. So to address this problem, what did we do? From a, from a distribute work and then get back and integrate everything together and then test it. To address that issue, what was the uh, practice that teams started practicing? Continuous integration, right? Any other practice? Early feedback. How do we get early feedback? What specific practice? Test driven development, fantastic. What else did we do? Continuous delivery. Continuous delivery. So we, we went further uh, all the way and, and, and started looking at continuous delivery, right? So let's talk about uh, birth of continuous integration. Uh, anyone knows which was the first continuous integration server? Fantastic. Uh, so I was on the team where we actually built the first continuous integration server. Uh, the first version of continuous integration server was something we wrote in flat 15 minutes. What was it? It was a cron job which would wake up and run the build and essentially would go through and say, okay, everything integrates and the t automated test that exists seems to work fine. All right? No fancy reports, no nothing, just a cron job running on the server that we had. Right, that was kind of the birth of CI. I'm not going to go into details of CI unless you guys feel I should. Uh, I'm assuming at this stage everyone's familiar with what continuous integration is in a nutshell. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, you know, to address the issue of late integration, uh, the practice of continuous integration was put in place. Uh, as Martin Fowler, who essentially popularized this practice, right, Martin Fowler should get the credit for bringing continuous integration to, uh, to, to the masses. Uh, he says that if it hurts, do it often and do it early, right? So that's the kind of principle behind continuous integration. If integrating late hurts you, then do it often and do it early. Uh, how does CI help? Increasing collaboration, decreasing delivery time, increasing feedback or early feedback, decreasing wastage because of all the, you know, rework and things like that. And in, inevitably, it essentially leads to a higher quality product that we are building. Has that been kind of experience you guys have faced? I want feedback and I want early feedback and I want a continuous integration. <laughs> right, so we did that. That was early 2000, 2001, right? What next? It's been 13 years. 
we could have come up with something better than that, right? So, you might have heard about the whole lean startup community, the Eric Rice wrote the lean startup book, but there have been a lot of interesting things the lean startup community has been doing and they talk about what is referred to as continuous deployment, right? So, taking continuous integration one step further and doing continuous deployment. I am not going to continuous delivery yet, I am specifically talking about continuous deployment, right? Everyone's familiar with what continuous deployment is, right? Like we do the continuous integration, we want to take it one step further and we also want to push it to our customers, right? As and when we do the continuous integration cycle, right? Sounds like a very small change, right? Sounds like a very small change. We were only deploying it on a test server. Now, we are actually going to push it to a production server. Obviously, we are not going to push it to all our servers. We are going to do it in an incremental fashion. We are going to roll it out uh, in a way such that we can roll back if bad things happen. So, we will do some of those things. But it sounds like a very small change. And when I first you know, heard about this and when I saw companies doing it, because I was at a few companies which were actually doing continuous delivery way before the word was coined or way before anyone actually was talking about it. Right, if you use Gmail, Gmail has been doing continuous delivery since 2006, right, way before the word continuous delivery was coined. Uh, but that small change actually has a profound impact on how you work. Uh, but the key thing I want to focus is I do not want to go into continuous deployment, but there is one element inside continuous deployment which is testing. Right? What happens to <coughs> testing? Now, inside, if we want to do continuous deployment, obviously, continuous deployment is like the you know the vision for every company at this point. Everyone wants to be able to deploy stuff continuously. I've worked with companies which are doing hardware development. They actually have tractors running in in things, and they're talking about doing continuous delivery, right? They want to they want to continuously deploy software on the tractors running across the world. There are companies doing all kinds of medical devices and they are talking about continuously pushing in the latest greatest stuff, right. So, that is seems like the gold dream for every company, but what is the problem to get there? Any guesses? Testing, because we all have what we love the ice cream cone, right or in other words the inverted testing pyramid and which is kind of what I would want to focus the rest of this talk talking about this is the problem we have today and if we want to go to continuous delivery, how do we make the transition and I am going to talk about what specific things we have done to make this transition, but I am also going to set some context in terms of what this means and how this goes. You have question. Uh, this is based on my observation of what percentage of the tests in a given company. Uh, how they were distributed, right? So, there were only about 1 to 5 percent of tests that were unit tests, right? There were about 5 to 10 percent of the tests in terms of integration. So, when I say percentage, I am talking about coverage, right? So, only about uh, 5 to 10 percent of the coverage of the overall code was coming from these kind of tests. And then end to end tests had a 10 to 20 percent coverage. Majority of the coverage came from manual testing. How many people here have this problem today? Okay. So, I want to talk about how with two specific companies we have inverted the testing pyramid, we have fixed the testing pyramid, I am going to talk about how we fixed it and what are the specific things we did, uh, but that is kind of really the focus of this talk. So, this is a good time to leave if this is not what you expect from the talk. Uh, commercial break, like before starting any good thing, we have to have a commercial break in between. So, my name is Naresh Jain, uh, I live in Mumbai, I started the bunch of communities, I am an entrepreneur, I have two startup companies, uh, one helps kids learn mental arithmetics and another one is a, is a marketplace for conferences, uh, none of these are launched, we are not doing continuous delivery on these projects yet, uh, because we are still even trying to figure out how to solve the problem, right. We have spent about a year now building something for kids on the iPad, which is a game, 
uh, and it took us a year to even get to this stage to figure out. We've, we've obviously done regular tests or almost continuous tests with kids all the time over the year, but you know, there's still a long way to go. Bunch of companies I've worked with as an employee or as a consultant, uh, just to give you some background in terms of the, the different experiences that I've had. All right, so that's uh, enough about me. Uh, now let's get back to the actual topic. Uh, has anyone heard about the distinction between testing and checking? I don't expect you to read that. Uh, anyone knows who this guy is? Michael Bolton? Good guesses. So, Michael Bolton was the first person actually at one of the conference he came up and he started talking about the distinction between testing and checking and everyone was like, uh, what do you mean? It right? doesn't make any sense. Of course, we do testing and he's like, no, you actually don't do testing, you do checking. Right? So, what is the distinguish, distinction between testing and checking? I already know something right? and I want to validate if what I know actually meets my criteria and he says that is checking that is not testing. What is testing then? Testing is where I do not know exactly what I want. right? I am exploring, I am trying to figure out what would happen if I did this to the system. If I poke the system in this way, what would happen? right? So, this is profound because what I want to highlight here is you can automate 100 percent everything that is checking centric. Everything that we think of checking can be automated 100 percent, but everything that is testing centric, which is exploratory centric, where I do not know what to assert, where I do not know what is the expected outcome, right? I cannot automate. So, when we talk about continuous delivery, right, are teams doing the, are teams doing checking or are teams doing testing? They can do checking, but interestingly, I will also talk about how they also do testing and how they incorporate testing into this thing. But the point I am trying to make is vast majority of companies today are doing checking and thinking they are doing testing and they are still stuck in the manual thing because they think it is exploratory in nature. Right? I was recently at a company and they were saying, you know, you cannot automate 100 percent. And, but Agile says you need to automate 100 percent. That is not true. These guys do not know what they are talking about. So, I said, hang on. Let me draw a distinction. Checking and testing. Now, can we say what can be automated, what cannot be automated? And they are like, ah, now we understand why they are saying you can actually do 100 percent automation, which is essentially checking and not testing. Right? So, coming back to our inverted testing pyramid, uh, what we want to do is this is the end state we want to be in. I am going to pause, let you read through this and then I am going to talk through this. You might have seen another triangle which is a much smaller triangle, uh, which actually I will talk a little later in terms of that triangle works well, but if you are actually doing anything real world substantially big, this is my experience. This is after doing it for about 10 years, this is where we ended up with right? and this is what I think as of today the current state of what the inverted testing pyramid should look like. It might change tomorrow, so disclaimer right there. Right? Uh, Everyone is familiar with unit tests. So, we are saying we need about 70 percent of coverage of your overall functionality from unit tests, right? at least 70 percent. Is that easy to achieve? Experience shows that we can actually do it fairly well on large, large number of projects we have done this fairly well. So, these numbers are not research numbers, right? these numbers are personal experience numbers. So, take it with a pinch of salt because this is my experience, this is not an industry standard. Business logic acceptance test, what does that mean? Business logic acceptance test is on large projects we have large number of teams trying to build a whole product. So, to, to get one end to end workflow of what a user would experience is fairly large. 
right? If I am in a bank and I am trying to get one trade, go from one end to another end, that might actually take about five or six days for it to complete as in not development time but actual physical time for the trade to actually go through right if i am in if i'm in a if i'm in a medical company right if i'm in a hospital it might take 6 days for you to actually do a blood assessment to get the report to figure out what next uh, you know treatment needs to be done and that's a flow when a patient comes in right that might take a significant amount of effort it might need deep experience so you take each portion so you know, given a blood test report, what are the results for it? That itself is, 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 is a good enough logic which could be covered through this acceptance test. But will that meet an end-to-end -end requirement for a user? Not really, right? So I'm trying to distinguish between an end-to-end acceptance test, right, or a workflow test as I call, to a business logic test. These are tests, again, because these are exploratory in nature to start with and then they get converted to checks, okay. Integration tests, what are integration tests? Integration tests are if there are two components talking to each other or if my system is talking to a subsystem, I want to make sure that the interface between the two is well established. I do not care about the logic, because the logic can be tested in different places, right. I am interested in making sure the integration, the, the touch points between the two is tested well. This is where you can do a lot of negative path testing, right? What happens if the server goes down? What happens if it cannot take this kind of a load? What happens if this does not happen, right? If a typical, if I expect a lot of concurrent connections happening to a particular system, right? It is possible that it can get into a deadlock. What would happen if it gets into a deadlock, right? That is exploratory in nature. And that is something that you can cover with these, te these kind of tests. Then you move to your workflow test which is given a patient comes in, what are the different steps that would happen in my system, what are the different touch points. You move further up which is you know from an end to end workflow point of view, uh, how does it flow through the system. One layer below the UI, one layer below the actual user interface and then the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the pyramid is essentially stuff which will click buttons or stuff which will actually have user interaction and then go all the way through. So if you lay it out in this way, this is kind of where we want to get and if we can get there, I believe we have been able to successfully get companies to do continuous delivery, continuous deployment and that is kind of what we refer to as inverting the testing pyramid. There are also bunch of things marked in terms of where you can do performance tests, where you can do security tests because those are important as well if you are building large critical systems. Okay. So this is the end state we want to be in and the rest of the talk will talk about how do we get to that end state. Question. Yes, please. Uh, is one person coverage? Well, so it will touch other things and you will get a higher coverage but that is already covered through this thing. There is one additional percentage which was not covered before that's what you would get from here i would be able to test a particular user interaction in my unit tests i don't need to do an end to end test to right. test a particular piece of the ui What could go wrong on clicking on a button? What would go wrong if somebody clicks on the button? Can you test here? They don't need to know, right? Absolutely. Correct. So you will show that, right? But that is one which your coverage is very less, right? So for example, in the unit test, okay, a developer goes and writes a piece of code, probably could be a function, right? So if the unit test all it does, it doesn't build a button to click on 
right? Why not? That's what we've done. So on the Gmail team. So I don't. I'm not talking about most of the time, right? I'm talking about what should be the end state and how it should be done. We'll take that offline because I think there's a misconception. I'm not talk, I'm talking about the coverage they would give as you go up. So here you've got 70 percent coverage. When you go up, right? I'm saying this is 10 percent in addition to what the 70 percent you have. So it becomes 80 percent coverage at this point. As you keep moving up, when you build this, you should have 100 percent coverage. It keeps adding up as you go up. No, no, no. What I'm trying to say is, as you build up. Right? It covers more. But what I will focus is the one person that was not yet covered. So what you mean is that by the time you become to testing Q, 99 percent of it is tested. Correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. Just that one person is pure QI. Okay? Yes. Uh, but again, right, in all other things you would have typically would have touched on the GUI, would have tested all the right? Okay, I, I need to move on. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not talking about testing time at all, right? No, what? Sure. We will. We will. As we go further, we'll talk about you know how some of those elements will be pulled further. For example, if you see, we are doing some amount of performance tests right here, right? because we don't want to wait to this point to see that. And I'm also going to talk about uh, when each of these are happening and how they are happening because that will help you understand more from the time it takes and things like that. Okay. Why the name inverting the testing pyramid? It actually comes from this book called inverting the pyramid. Anyone's heard of this book called inverting the pyramid? It has nothing to do with software. It has to do with soccer and how you know in if you see, if you go back in history and you look at how teams were structured in soccer or in football, right? you would see that early on uh, there was like a very heavy focus on fronters, right? the front people and the, in the goal post. And then as you go back, the teams were structured saying less midfielders, very few defenders, and then it would be a triangle like that. The South American teams came in and thrashed the European teams for five years together. right? And then this author kind of went back and started looking at structurally what is different about these two teams. And then he wrote this book saying, you know, inverting the testing pyramid, how the uh, South American teams actually had an invert, inverted structure of the team structure in terms of how they are on the ground. And that helped them actually beat these guys over and over again. And today, if you see, most teams are structured in the, in the soccer and where they have very few forwards, they have a good number of midfields and a large number of defense, right? So that was the book kind of talking about that and I was like, you know what, this kind of is very similar to what we are trying to do in testing. So that's the name, uh, inverting the testing pyramid. Uh, this is just a slide to highlight the problem with an end-to-end -end test which is where a lot of companies seem to focus a large amount of their effort, right? The amount of end-to-end -end tests it would take for someone to cover the whole system is very high, right? And those tests are extremely complicated and extremely fragile and time consuming, right? So if something breaks here, for example, if I run one of these end-to-end -end tests and if something breaks, I have no clue where it actually went wrong, right? So I would spend the next maybe half a day or a day debugging through my system, figuring out where something went wrong. Okay, that's not mine. Uh, so what ends up happening is you end up building a large number of end-to-end -end tests which are extremely fragile, complicated, and they don't give you the pinpointed feedback. So this is and typically the end to end test can only be written when the whole system is up and running which probably is too late to get feedback again right so we want to move away from this model 
we also looked at based on some projects I worked we looked at the ROI from testing the ROI that we get from testing and you know where we do we get the biggest buck for the bank right and what we found is a large number of things could actually be caught at the unit level which you know we should be doing and it only takes about 10 percent effort in trying to build them right these numbers are at a very high level just to give you an indicator they are not accurate number going to decimal val values right and as we move up the effort becomes much more and the return on investment becomes very less so something to keep in mind why inverting the pyramid is extremely important right so now let's talk about how do we invert the pyramid all right uh, earlier I also touched upon a lot of people might have seen this I had this in one of my presentations back in 2004 I think I was talking about acceptance test driven development and I was talking about this is exactly how we do things and since then I've worked on very large scale systems and we've realized that this is not the whole picture right this has many gaps that we've not filled and over the years we've kind of evolved to something more bigger but if you're working on a small single team agile project I think this is good enough right but I see more and more large scale multi-sided you know programs running where they have one product being built by multiple teams you need something like that uh, I'm going to not go into details of each of this but quickly touch upon this this is there up in the slide for reference so you can go into details of this and read through this but I want to quickly touch through this this was a very detailed slide that I presented recently to someone explaining all the different levels of testing why they are done what tools are used at what level would you write what is the objective of it right right starting from your unit tests so what is the objective of your unit tests right during your sprint or during your iteration while you're coding right you want to make sure that it's really blurry for whatever reason uh, you want to make sure that each class functions exactly as you expected right as you move you know things start increasing in its scope and things start covering more than what the you know the unit tests cover who is involved when they are involved so this goes into fair bit of detail I don't think we have time to kind of go into details of this and I'm hoping that you guys can kind of read this in more detail at a later point in time but these are all the different levels of tests that we showed in the testing pyramid these are the kind of people who should be involved some tools that I have used in my experience there are many more tools that are available and I'm sure you can do the mapping uh, and when it's done what level it's done and what is the objective I think the objective is the most important thing that I want to quickly talk about right here we're talking about each class each module each unit of your system functions correctly and I want to make sure as I'm building them I'm getting the feedback earlier on right here we're talking about from a business logic point of view for a particular end-to-end -end system end-to-end -end in terms of an architecture flow not necessarily from a business users point of view but an end-to-end -end, uh, from a flow I fill in a form I go in I give in some details and then you know it goes in it sits in the database or some data store it sends out a message and then it comes back right that's only part of the thing and I want to make sure that is tested and it's working fine as I go next level it's you know whether two components can actually interact with each other have I flushed out the interface correctly between the components as we go further you know you look at like for example a trade flow whether it can actually go through the whole trade flow there are multiple steps inside that are we doing that correctly ensuring further you know again I'm taking an example of trade over here from a bank kind of perspective to kind of describe how each of these things go and last we are ensuring that everything from an end to end point of view you know like you talked about you know kicking a button all the way is that working perfectly fine so we want to make sure all of these are covered but more importantly when does this happen what's the flow in this thing right so I'm talking about touch, testing touch points through the project lifecycle and at what points does this come in so I'm not sure if there's something I can do to make this better it's been okay that's bad news uh, so we're talking about I'll, I'll just read through this so hopefully it will be fine so we're talking about kicking off a product or a project with what we call as a product discovery right a typical one week to two week session where you kind of try and understand what is the overall uh, high level vision of the product that we are trying to build 
what are the different release milestones that we think roughly at this point and what would be you know the acceptance criteria at each level of your story map right so this is kind of you know we are building a story map and in, in the story map you have the goals of your users then you go down one more level then you say these are the activities that the users would do you go one more level down and you say these are the tasks that they would perform you go one more level down and you'll say to achieve this user task these are my epics then you go one more level down and you'll say to achieve this epic these are my user stories right so you can build that tree structure and at each level of the tree structure you can define acceptance criteria right so to meet these goals i need to be able to do these four activities that's my acceptance criteria at that level and as you keep drilling down you are defining what your acceptance criteria are so here we've got the different levels we've got the acceptance criteria then we move to the release planning level where we talk about you know what are the goals how do we assess we are ready for this right how do we ship this so as you go down you will start looking at a release level inside a release you might have multiple themes that you are attacking one theme at a time right so the for the first theme how do we ensure the theme is coherent how do we ensure this is functioning as as expected so a lot of these you might not know at this stage you're kind of discovering exploring what do you want so you start putting in things saying i would wish this happens right you don't have a system yet in place to ensure that will happen but this is what you're trying to say is my acceptance criteria you might have different work streams that will work inside a in, inside a release and you want to make sure that all these different work streams are collaborating this is where you will define your integration kind of tests how each team will communicate with each other and stuff like that as we go through we are going from a high level product level product vision point of view writing acceptance criteria all the way up to when you do your sprint planning this is where you define your story level acceptance criteria at this point you've done a lot of definition or exploration of what expected behavior you would want from the system okay and here onwards during the sprint you actually collaborating with the devs the biz guys the business guys you writing automated acceptance tests and before you write any tests you actually writing what you have captured before this you are converting them into something that's executable they will not work yet because you don't have a system in place right but you capturing them i'm going to show you a few examples of how we do that right and then as we move further we kind of ensuring that at each of these levels what you had defined is actually being fulfilled so this is more about the definition and that is more about the validation right some people look at it and say oh this is nothing but old wine and new bottle the v model right it is in some sense but in a lot of sense it is not because the, we are talking about along the way you are actually kind of making them automated right it's not a manual step at every stage but that's still a thought process it's a valid thought process to have all right so far is this clear right as we move through the project life cycle at what point we are defining what and how we are capturing them different kinds of tests will come in so where would you typically see riding a uh, unit test for example when would a unit test be written in this life cycle sprint level right fairly obvious what about integration tests i'll come to you in a minute one second this would be at the work stream planning when you're doing your work stream planning you would start defining what you know your touch points would be how you would expect them to behave right much before somebody has actually started building code but sometimes these will be very ambiguous you have no clue you might want to do a spike story right to figure out what this would actually look like how these two systems will talk talk to each other right sometimes you don't even have the other system in place right again you want to try and capture some stuff by actually doing your uh, you know spikes by doing different technical stories uh, but it is all centered around doing stuff rather than just spending time in meetings and doing triage meetings and what not right a gentleman over here had a question you need to speak up we we'll start automation right here because we start defining these and these would be executable right from the get go these will not work these will fail right but as we keep going through uh, you know some of them will start working and when a whole feature is built that's when all of these would be automate you know already automated but executing at this point right 
again uh, going back to you know when, when typically we say automation people think of you know using an automation tool which will go record the screen and things like that we have moved away from that at least for a decade now right uh, we are looking at tests which will essentially go uh, for large portions of stuff going one layer below it and actually driving it right and then you can easily put a driver on top of it which will actually go poke a UI for you okay so automation starts is, is a part of this whole process it's a very integral part of it it's not something we can easily say now is when you know automation will happen okay some of these are ambiguous at this point it might not be clear an example would be good to look at and that's what I want to get to uh, but also I want to kind of jump into I don't know if you've seen this collaborative product discovery uh, what are the different steps and how you know this flows through what happens at what stage what kind of you know things we are capturing but throughout this we are actually capturing acceptance criteria which are then to be automated using your acceptance test. Uh, I'm going to take a quick. Actually, let's. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of this. Uh, but any questions on this in terms of have have people seen this before? How many people have seen this before? Okay, not many people. So let's actually spend a minute on this, talking through this, right? So we talk about uh, the elevator pitch, the business goals, what we are trying to achieve. Uh, which is what is chartering this happens right at the beginning of your release right at the beginning of your product discovery uh, you know product uh, when you are planning your product you come up with uh, you know pragmatic personas different kinds of personas that you have which, which are your likely users that are going to use uh, for each of them you define user goals what is the goal that they are trying to achieve from your system right why should why should somebody looking at testing care about this. right testing unfortunately in large companies that I go is about given this requirement the spec document that is given to me can the system meet that spec document right and we have seen this movie before right which does not have a happy ending how many people have seen that movie before right and it does not have a happy ending because yes I verified what was there in the document but that completely missed the point. Right? It did not capture whether at the end of it the system did not really solve the end user's problem. So one has to obviously uh, throughout the process be very cautious and cognitive about what is the end user's goal and are we actually meeting the end user's goal. Right? So as you go through this uh, you, you have to make sure that at each level you have acceptance criteria defined. We talk about you know the activity map, the task map and as we go through this when we get to the user stories a lot of people only write acceptance criteria at the user story level which means I will test that this story in isolation does what it is supposed to do but that does not tell me anything about whether the system will solve the end users problem or not right and that is a big gap that I see in a large companies and when, when the focus is so much around user stories imagine now deploying at the end when the user story is built do you think you would actually be able to deploy it into production you will not because you so down the lane that you have only tested one little piece and you have no assurance that the system actually will solve the problem for the user right. So which is why I think this is extremely important uh, to, to cover in terms of this is these are the different stages and this happens right at the beginning of your release okay. Uh, if you need more details about this I suggest you talk to Jeff Patton, Jeff Patton is here he can actually go into a lot more details about this uh, you know. I learned a lot of this from Jeff in fact and then I have kind of brought in the whole acceptance criteria driven discovery aspect of it where we actually use acceptance criteria at each level to drive our discovery process right. So if we use the acceptance criteria to say okay if this is the goal what is the least amount of work that I need to do to have a delightful feature but also to meet the actual goal and can I actually do that with as little possible right. So you kind of drive using acceptance criteria. Everyone was have, must be familiar with a typical continuous integration process but I want to focus more on what we refer to as the build pipeline and I am going to talk about at the build pipeline level what kind of tests get executed, what gets verified, mapping it back to the pyramid that we talked about okay. So the, the, the simplest form of your build is the local dev build 
right, which every developer would run on their local machine. What would they verify in, as part of this build? They would ensure that all the unit tests are working, but also the acceptance test that they wrote. Right? I am trying to satisfy a particular story's acceptance criteria, are they working? Right? Have I broken something which I am touching in a big workflow, I am touching one portion of it, have I broken anything in the workflow? Right? So that is what you want to verify at the local build level. Correct. Which is why the business level acceptance criteria that I talked about, that is the business level acceptance criteria, not the end to end workflow acceptance criteria. Because that might have like, I am sure you are aware of that, that might have talking to hardware, that might have things like doing that which might not be available, right. So this is, this is still at your uh, component level in that sense. But if it is a simple project, I am building a web based product for someone, let us say Gmail for example. I could actually do the whole thing here, right. So it does obviously vary from system to system and I am talking about more complicated system where the hardware dependency or other kind of third party dependency where you will not be able to do everything over here. So we want to be pragmatic. What is possible in this environment we want to do that, right. You check in the code then each team has their CI server, right. That does a check out and if you actually see these guys, uh, you know, we also have some time indicators over here based on what we, what should be the ideal time these builds should take, you know. What is the feedback cycle you should have? If it takes too long, then you are not getting the right feedback cycle. You have put too many things in it. You need to break them apart, right. So you get the most important early feedback as, as early as possible. So the smoke build essentially ensures all the unit tests, all the uh, tests that you are working inside the sprint are actually working, right. This might still not test the end to end thing. That kicks off when on success, that kicks off your functional build, which essentially ensures that from a functionality point of view for this particular module, this particular team, the functionality works as is and it is not broken anything, right. Uh, then you go to the cross stream build, which means if I am integrating with other teams, you know, let us kick off. Uh, if you notice at each of these points, there are some things being published in the dependency management system which means at every level you are not going to be compiling code and doing things, you are just going to build off what was there previously. For example, if you are building using Java, right, this thing would have built something and put, pushed a jar back into the system, right. This thing would come, pick the jar, take the jars from the other modules, build a system out of it and then run it, right. So you are not going to, you are going to try and reduce as much as possible in terms of not doing everything from start, right. Some of these might not even be a clean build. What a clean build means is you are not going to clean out the environment and start from scratch. A lot of them can just use the existing database, can use the existing thing and just run on, on top of it which we call as the incremental build. So there is the next slide after this which talks about which one is an incremental build while which one is a clean build. So clean environment versus an incremental environment. Both are extremely important. We try to do both of these. Uh, so anyway, you have the theme level build which will essentially run in your uh, system integration test environment and ensure that at the theme level all of these things are connected and working together. Each of these have the tests that we have written before, right. As we walk through those life touch points, we said we will write these kind of tests, we will write these kind of tests. At each level those are the tests that are running. Who is responsible for those tests? each respective team that is going to be touching on that portion will be responsible for that test. There are times when you will form a task force team, right, a team which is people from three different teams getting together forming a task force team whose responsibility is to make sure, you know, the team level tests are working fine. A nurse comes in, she wants to see which patient needs immediate attention that touches across three different teams, right. So let us bring one representative from each team and let's them, let them get together and write these tests. Then they would go back to their respective teams and actually implement that functionality. Not, not after you build the whole thing, get everyone together and say how the heck do we test this, right. Let us get them and say this is the expectation, this is the goal we are trying to meet. The nurse when she comes in in the morning into the hospital, she immediately wants to see which patient needs attention, right. That is a workflow. For that workflow, let us bring the people together, form a task force or just in time team and get them to define what is the expectation from each team level. Then they would go back to their teams and implement that stuff, right. 
this test now is already there in the system. This would be ignored at this point. If you are using a tool like Cucumber or something, it would mark it as ignored. This is not yet working. When the last person commits the code saying, okay, this is working, then you know, it will basically turn from ignored to working now. And it should now continue working from now onwards. All right? So like this, you proceed. And at some point in most organizations, there is a cutoff which means no longer you will be able to access your version control and the configuration management team will take over from there. And from there it would essentially go into production, right? So what we want is ideally on a large complex project right from here when somebody checks in without any manual intervention, going through all of these builds and doing the build promotion and essentially being in production. That's what is continuous deployment, right? So if we do all these different steps, if we have this environment set up, this is obviously the most complicated ones that I have worked in. There are much systems where only there are three environments, right? The smaller the scope of the project, the less the complex, the less, less of the complexity, the smaller it would be in terms of these different stages, okay? The, so we talked about the cross stream planning, right? which is where you sit down and you say what mm -hmm. we are saying that there is a lot of maturity that needs to come in to be able to work in this model right but this is where we want to evolve to because this is what in my belief and this is what I have seen on few projects is helped us actually achieve continuous delivery, right? This is a prerequisite if you will. That's okay in my opinion. We get started and we realize that we miss this, we miss this and we inspect and we adapt. That's the agility part of it, right? And we figure out that this is where we want to be. Let's get started today. Right? As we go through it, we realize, oops, we completely missed this aspect. You know, who's going to do data uh, management? Right? We never thought about that because that would become an issue. That's okay. Right? It's not the end of the world. Let's come back and say, okay, how are we going to handle data across these different teams? <laughs> Too bad for them. <laughs> Yes, sir. It is not, right? These don't have to be same as the production system. I think that's a big misconception. I'll tell you, for example, this one would not even have an actual physical database. This would just have an in-memory database, right? Why? Because can that help me validate what I'm trying to validate at this stage? Do I really need production data with all the information? No, not really, right? Because this test is very focused on what it's trying to do and for that I don't need the whole system. There's another slide which actually goes into details of what system is required, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a clean system, a clean environment, it's an incremental environment and uh, that will address a little bit more. But as you actually go through this, your system keeps getting closer and closer to the real production system. I have never worked in a system except some projects that I have built on my laptop and I have made money out of it where my laptop is essentially the production environment, right? Or I am working directly on the server. Those are exceptions. Those will be 1% of the projects that are done, right? Most projects don't have the luxury of having production-like environment even at this stage. But it is not required. I don't think that's required. As you progress through, you want to get closer and closer to your production system, right? I would say at your UAT level and at your staging level, right? You need to be as close. Or in fact, I would say at the staging level, it has to be exactly the same. For example, you need to have DNS routing if you're doing a web-based project, right? You need to have DNS routing. You need to have your, uh, you know, all the different infrastructure at the staging environment. And most companies, I think they do have that some level or the other. Okay. All version control is happening, right? In your version control or it's happening in your configuration management system. 
but it's all version control it's all automated use puppet use whatever scripting you want to do right it's not something that we're saying that this is zero manual intervention yes correct let's go back to that right if you look at this when are the integration tests written we talked about the integration tests are written at this point right these are written you know you could form a task force team as i was explaining they would get together before even your sprint planning starts because how do you know what piece of that you need to build right so this would actually to some extent drive out your specific stories you might only be at the epic level at, at this point this is essentially drive out the stories for each of the teams that have a touch point right so this is where you would write your integration tests Th this is you you take it as a part of your sprints i mean i'm going to even talk about uh, many teams we don't do sprints anymore that's that's a 19th century thing for me right that that artificial boundary of doing sprints we've moved away from that but i don't suggest you start with that right it's it's an evolution you get into the rhythm of doing fixed time boxes once you get good at it you can do away with the ceremony right many teams we work when we actually talk about continuous delivery we don't have these artificial boundaries of sprints but when you do have them during your sprint right a portion of the time is going towards you know doing the special task force or a specific individual from the team is taken out from the capacity for that sprint who is responsible there are different techniques to handle that and those are again you, we have a whole bunch of different techniques but i i i mean that's not been a problem per se so i didn't highlight that fact okay any other questions at this stage one thing i just realized is you know a lot of people say that it takes a you know 6 days to go through this process and you're like do you really need to actually simulate the 6 day thing or can you actually write tests which will essentially give you the same experience but it'll do you do the same thing in less than 20 seconds and the answer is yes most of the times we're able to find ways of doing that in 20 seconds can i be 100% sure that that will not anything will not go wrong no after doing all of this you can never be 100% sure after doing all of this do you do you not spot bugs in gmail every now and then right do you not spot issues every now and then but are those issues something that will bring down gmail no there are small issues here and there which is slipped out there's monitoring going on they they figure out that something is you know not the convention and they catch that early on and then they fix it immediately so i'd rather have some of those things slightly slip out right if you're if you're working for an energy company where even a small mistake is costing you a billion dollars right then can you have a system which will dog food your stuff right for example they have a power plant and they actually have monitoring software which will run on the power plant for their office and they continuously deliver to that environment and if the power goes down too bad you screwed up so now you know you go back and fix that so you can reduce the impact by trying and finding ways of either dog fooding it or doing other kinds of things i understand that that might not be possible every single case but can majority of the things be handled like that right i want to move ahead just want to make sure i've covered everything so this is the one thing that i was talking i'm sorry about the projector it's really hazy to even see anything so this one actually talks about the objective of each of each build what is the objective of each build what are we trying to achieve uh what is the job that happens what are the stuff that happens during this build right uh what is the duration who are the stakeholders what triggers this at what what frequency are you triggering this right and where is it happening on what kind of an environment it is happening here i also talk about it's incremental this is also incremental here we say that there are stubs or marks put in place as we move forward you know th this thing and then at some point we actually do a clean environment so this is a clean environment we actually set up the whole dependencies from scratch we build the whole thing from scratch and we want to make sure that a clean environment this goes fine 
So, you actually go into details of this and it talks about what happens at what stage, whether it is a clean environment, whether it is an incremental environment. So, when I what I mean by incremental environment is let us say I had a database right, the last build that was deployed on it uh, you know did some changes to the database structure. The next build that is going to run is not going to tear apart the whole database and build it from scratch. It is going to run a migration file which essentially will bring your schema to the level you expect it to be right. So, it is an incremental system. While there will be a system where you would essentially say I am going to tear this whole thing apart and I am going to start from scratch. I am going to use a virtual machine, I am going to deploy this and it is going to be you know exactly what I want okay. So, there is that is the difference between the let us see if you can fix that no okay that is fine. Uh, these are really bad from user experience these slides because these are more meant for someone to kind of go into details and look at them not ideal for pretty picture presentations. But I think these is I am kind of running through this as a food of thought and these slides are already available so you can actually go into details of this into much more. Uh, I wanted to get to this point and I want to talk about uh, some people did highlight issues that they have seen when they are trying to do this. I am curious to hear if anybody else has tried something like this and what issues they have faced. Anyone? Sure. It might not, so there are two ways of slicing stories. One way of slicing stories is from a technical point of view that this is easy for me to build, it is still end to end, but this is easy for me to build. Yeah. Another way to slice stories is that this is the smallest thinnest slice of things where you know I will just automate a little bit pieces here and there and that will still give you an end to end experience, but might not cover all the cases, might not give you all the sophistication. So, one is slicing it around sophistication, one is slicing it around how you build it right. So, I can still slice it where it is very bare bone right, it does not give you all the sophistication, but it gets someone to experience what the system will feel like right. Can I get feedback at that level rather than doing the whole sophistication piece of it and then going to them saying oh you know what I was expecting a bicycle you built an aeroplane right, we do not want that, we want that early feedback. And in a lot of systems I have worked where we have actually done continuous deployment where we shipped software 20 times a day, 30 times a day. We only do one small portion of that and we deploy it right. It makes that one bottleneck go away in your workflow right. Then you attack the next bottleneck, then you attack the next bottleneck and eventually maybe over a month you would have cleared out the whole thing. But I can still get feedback and still address a small issue right now. Like one of the systems I built which is an e-learning software for industrial logic right where we would deploy things multiple times a day and we would say okay now we need to add a new feature which is you know we have students who are coming on a e-learning course they are you know interacting they are doing a lot of things they are asking questions and we get emails we respond to it we have an SLA that we respond within 24 hours since the email. But we said you know what that is a long time can we actually have a live chat right where if we are online they can directly chat with us if they have a question around you know what this topic means we can immediately answer that that would take us a while to build the whole thing right. It would not happen in you know we were not even doing sprints, but it would not happen you know immediately. So, we said well what is the smallest thing I can do and deploy. Guess what we did. Would you like to chat? Like to chat? Uh, what we ended up doing something similar is we actually built a fake feature. We said let us let us put a chat button over there 33 users and 6 experts online right and see how many people actually click that and see what the response is right. It turns out over a week that we had it out there uh, 94 percent of the people who logged into the system clicked on that right. So, there is suddenly that curiosity and then it said uh, would you like to continue and most people said no. So, it said ok good enough let us scrap this we do not need to build this and then we sent out a survey to all the people who took that right and we asked them why would you not want to do this because is not it so much more convenient. They said I do not want to chat with some random person I want to chat only with my company specific individual. So, then we pivoted and we said 
can we do it in that way and there we got a lot of traction and then we went about building that gradually and it was again piece by piece it would still send us an email and we would you know respond back the email would show up as if it is a live chat right so gradually we take the infrastructure we have and we slice it but were we able to deploy it every time we checked in yes I actually would say no because what ends up happening is then you are not getting the feedback, right? Then it still ends up becoming because that is a slippery slope. We can see where we can slice it, where we can add some feature and as far as slicing is. Yes. But we want to get as early feedback as possible because if I keep building it and I am not activated it, yes I am deploying it but what is the point? I am not getting any feedback, right? So it is just ceremony now at this point rather than anything else, right? So yes that is a problem and we need to find creative solutions to how we can do such that we actually deploy it and we not just ask people for feedback, we actually monitor and we see quantitative data, right? We do A-B tests. You do two different kinds of things and you see what is the reaction, right? That is all kind of going into what we were talking continuous delivery, right? Where it is not about continuously building a whole bunch of software and putting out there. It is about trying to figure out this is the goal I am trying to meet, right? What is the cheapest, easiest way for me to meet that goal? And can I even do fake features now, put it out there, ship it, right? And see, uh, you know, if that is something people want. When I go through that, I want to make sure I do not break anything else because a lot of times our experience is I am only doing a fake feature but actually break something else which is where this whole infrastructure becomes important to have in place. Yes, please. Support and maintenance is actually the easiest one in my opinion to, to put continuous delivery. When I am building a new product, I have no clue what users want my minimum viable thing might actually be so big in a lot of cases that getting to continuous delivery will actually be a challenge. So I hear you, right? It's a it's a fantastic point that you bring up. So my take is that the system is already working to some extent. If I start doing things to it, I'm not going to make it much worse than what it was before, right? So do I really need to have all that automation to start with, or can I say we have this? I'm going to only do this one micro check. I'm going to do pair uh, pair, pair programming. I'm going to do code review. I'm going to do a whole bunch of testing. I'm going to do a whole bunch of manual checks in it before we can actually do to that, but that gives us the confidence of pushing out small things one at a time. So if you do not have any CI framework, which is what I am assuming, I do not think you need to have this elaborate setup to start with. You incrementally build it as you go along, right? You incrementally build it, but it's easy because I know what I want to expect, right? Which is where I was coming from, right? It's easy because I know what is the eventual setup I want in terms of the infrastructure and things like that. It's hard to put all of those things in place. It might be time consuming. It might take three months. It might take six months to have this. That would be a big risk, right? And you would not want to push that risk too late. So you might have a bunch of virtual machines sitting on your side, each one kind of replicating your environment. Let, let it run on your virtual environments, all different configuration. Gmail, if you know how many combinations we test it on, it is mind blowing because it has to matter with what version of the browser you have, what version of the operating system you have, 
what other plugins you have installed. Uh, I once built a plugin for Outlook, right? It is like ancient, but that was very important. Uh, and Outlook, you would not believe how many different environments we had because you know, if you have a small plugin in Outlook, that can completely destroy your code, right? It can completely destroy your feature. Uh, for the e learning that I was talking about, we have people using Eclipse, we have people using uh, Visual Studio, we have people using IntelliJ, we have people using all of these and then operating system combinations, right? We had virtual environments which would have been configured and we would run all of these, right? Did we do that on day one? No. But we gradually built it. We said which is the most likely environment, which is the most riskiest environment. Let us put that in place. So, we will gradually get there. Uh, I think I am pretty much done except this test driven development cycle which I am sure all of you have seen before. Uh, I kind of ran through this, but this kind of explains at a nutshell level how this acceptance test driven development is built into the development cycle, right. But notice I have something called exploratory testing over here which is not automated, which is manual. But it happens as and when inside my sprint a developer says, I think I am done, I have all my acceptance tests which are automated working, right? Okay, you are saying all the automated tests are working. Is there something that could break from an exploratory point of view? Let us actually do a quick exploratory test on that and verify that, right? So, yes, we can automate 100 percent, but there are things that are important that needs to be checked and that needs to be done as early as possible. It would, it would be a risk based exploratory test which means you would see what impact it would have and do I really need to do a whole end to end one or do I need to just test this and I would be good enough, right. So, it is again a risk based exploratory test, okay. I have blazed through a whole bunch of stuff, uh, it is time for a lunch break, but this kind of gives you at a very high level, not at a very detailed level how you know you could possibly look at inverting the testing pyramid to get towards continuous deployment. We did not really talk about what the system would look like if you are doing continuous deployment yet because this is still talking about how to get there, right. I gave a talk last year which talked about an example of a continuous deployment, the video is up online, uh, but that tells you what the system would look like if you are doing continuous deployment and how to get to continuous deployment more from the infrastructure point of view, okay. So, I think that is it pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to take them. Uh, thank you for coming.